This episode is brought to you by America's Rehab Campus. Get on the road to recovery with the best rehab in beautiful Arizona. Dial 1-833-272-7342. That's 1-833-ARC-REHAB. Ladies and gentlemen, you are now tuned in to the 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 Archers. Hey man, what can we say? You want to start it off? Top of the fuck. Yo, 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 good morning. Good morning, good morning. (laughs) Thank you guys for tuning in to another episode of the RCast. My name is Buddha. I'm Matt. I'm Dustin. And we are here once again. Man, this is this is awesome. There's a great energy today in the studio. We have a very special guest. This is our homeboy. He works with us. He has, you know, there's so many people here who have such amazing stories. So we are very, very grateful to have you here. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up to our homeboy. Admissions and Outreach Coordinator, Jeffy. Yeah. What's up, Jefferson? How you doing, bro? What up? What up? Sorry, man. I don't know. I don't know what's going on today. Things are a little. Got the ringer in the house. Everything's all good. Just another Wednesday. Yeah. You having a good day? So how was the ride down here? Ride down was pretty good. Yeah. Asshole truckers, but. Any speeding tickets? Yeah. No speeding tickets. No, nah, no. Nah. No. And I do have a pretty lucky track record. The fender on the car? Yeah. yeah. Oh, shit. It's, We're it's get bolted that. on. Yeah. Well, well, I mean, I don't have to that, worry uh, about gorilla people. tape is a motherfucker. Messing with it. <laughs> don't put it in your hair. That's what I hear. No, just gorilla I tape. did. <laughs> Look. <laughs> Hey man, it's a it's a pleasure to have you, dude. Thank you know, you we've been me. trying to get you in here and it just happened to work out that it there shit happens for a reason, right? So we're here right now. You know how this goes. We we come together, we have different walks of life, people here all the time sharing their testimonies about, you know, the things that they experienced through their addiction and where they're at now and their recovery and hoping that your story is gonna motivate and inspire others. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. let's start from the beginning. Where are you from? Are you from Tucson, Arizona? No, I was uh, born and raised in a small town in upstate New York, uh, Plattsburgh. New York. Yeah, right, New York. yeah about it's six hours town, north. Of, boy. Six hours north of New York City, right on the Canadian border. And when did you move down here? There's so well, many places in between, man. There's oh, yeah. so many places okay. in between this time when I moved to Arizona. Uh, moved here in 2016. 2016. August of 2016, right before my uh, 30th birthday. How long were you living in New York area, though? Uh, so I grew up. In New York, I lived there for about 17 years, 18 years. Okay, so you went to all yeah. schools up there. Yeah, elementary, middle, but I moved. Stayed in the same town? Did you live in the yeah. same house the whole time? No, 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 no. My childhood was from Plattsburgh to Canton to Peru, New York, little, even smaller Peru. town. Peru? Oh, yeah. oh, man. Even smaller town. You need a passport for that place? <laughs> no, it's a bunch of different towns raised by a single parent, and... uh you know, we moved around a lot. I lived in South Dakota for like two years. Oof. Dang. Um, Vermilion, South Dakota, I believe it was. What was the strangest place you ever lived? Uh, I mean, it's the strangest place because I love it, but New Orleans, just because it's so crazy. Yeah. You said single parent. Mom, mm-hmm. dad, what? Uh, just mother. Mother? My mother uh, raised my brother and I. My parents got divorced when I was about four. And uh, that kind of like started a lot of stuff in my life that led, you know, me to using and. So did your, did your dad disappear or did he stay in your life too? He was a manana dad, if we could call it. That's what I call it. Oh, yeah. You know, any anytime you would see him or talk to him, it would be, we'll do it tomorrow. I'll see you tomorrow. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Oh, and, okay. And tomorrow would never come. Gotcha. Which plays into how I kind of lived my life for a long time in most of the relationships I had. Because the only male role model I had was a telephone dad. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll do it tomorrow. I'll get it tomorrow. I'll get it tomorrow. Gotcha. And uh, so it messed me up, you know, but at the mm-hmm. same time, like, that's life. I got no control. And I since found out later in life that uh, that my dad's an alcoholic, you yeah. know. And Is that why they got divorced? I think that was a big part of it. Yeah. I mean, I, I found out a lot of stuff, you know. My parents kept me pretty sheltered to an yeah. extent, or my mom did. And so I didn't really know a lot of, of everything. Like, I just thought there was always a 12-pack of St. Pauli's girl in the fridge. At and everybody's in, house. Yeah, and that was normal. And yeah. it was always 12-pack, and there was nothing wrong with that. Yep. But it was always getting drank every night. <laughs> and it was wow. always getting replenished every yeah. night, you know. Brother, older or younger? Uh, my brother is about two years older than me. Gotcha. 
So just you and him and just, then mom. Yep. Yep. My mom, she's older. She waited, mm-hmm. uh, lived most of her life, went and experienced lots of things before she decided to have kids. And uh, so, yeah, he's 30, about to be 38 and I'm 36. So we're like 22 months apart, technically. Okay. Um, but yeah, we're super close. Grew up, like it was weird for me to not like have somebody around. So he was kind of like your male yeah, role model. Yeah, my, my real mole. I mean, even the mole. Yeah, mole, mole model. The mole uh, model. Yeah. yeah the so mole model. even though he was only two years older. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And your your mom, did she drink at all? She would drink. You know, she'd go to the liquor store and buy, uh, yes, liquor store where you, they only sell liquor in yeah. New York. You can only buy wine and liquor at a liquor store. <laughs> um, she would buy a, a $10 bottle of wine and maybe have a glass of wine every night with dinner. Okay. You know? But she never, like, went out and dated anyone she didn't really like party you never saw her drunk or anything like I that. i saw her hung over once and it was after my aunt's <laughs> bachelorette party <laughs> but she was you know 50 at the time so it was like yeah. you know once and uh you know she was super religious she would go on like retreats to monasteries like, really yeah what religion I, uh catholicism catholic oh catholic wow. yeah i was raised catholic did you go to a catholic school then no oh. no where i'm from there was one school and it's one building, you start out in elementary, then you go to middle, and then you go to high school. And it would all connect it. Wow. So the high school I graduated from had 380, 400 kids. So I had like 100, maybe 100 kids in my graduating class. Oh, that's 9 through 12? Yeah, 9 through 12 had about 400. Wow. Were you sober in high school? No. Absolutely <laughs> not. <laughs> not even close. Did you get kicked out of kindergarten too, like Dustin? <laughs> no, actually. No? I, what, I do find that surprising. What type of student were you? I mean, I think up until a certain point, like once once I was about like 12, I think that was because that's the time when I started using. Yeah. Um, I was like a pretty good student. And then like after that point, you know, I would, I'd get A's in certain classes, but then, you know, I never paid attention to math. I don't really like to read. So like that kind of held me back in a lot of different things. Um, uh-huh. I think I graduated with like a 76, 76 average, something like that. So like a C. Yeah. But um But you really didn't put no fucking effort no, in. Yeah. No, no effort. I, I I mean I know you, you're not a dumb dude, you know. I've you know, I go to college now That's online. Crazy. Well, was I took a little break for my own issues. But uh yeah, I'm not a not a stupid dude. So up until like twelve years old there was you know, it was regular mm-hmm. sports. Yep, played basketball, played baseball, played football, then that transitioned into basketball, football and lacrosse, kind of you know, was pretty good at those things, yeah. tra- like travel AAU basketball, mm-hmm. like, you know, um, travel lacrosse. There was some lacrosse was pro- like once I kind of, you know, towards the end of high school, that was kind of like the area in sports where it was going to lead. Like football, I played quarterback, I played defensive line, I played, you know, running back, did all these things, but I wasn't good enough to go anywhere in football, which was like my ideal dream. Yeah. Um, and so I kind of focused on lacrosse and I had some opportunities in that, but some decisions and choices I made in high school yeah. um, led me to kind of fuck those things off basically. Yeah. And uh, like once I did that, it just, I just said, F it. Yeah. Fuck it. Like I might as well just go full, full speed well, into this. Introduction then into, was it alcohol you first started with? Or yeah. Was it marijuana? Well, was it, how did, how did you get introduced to that scene? So with drugs, I mean, I remember taking like a sip of my dad's beer when I was a kid and yeah. I was like, this is horrible. I don't know why anybody <laughs> would ever drink this. Um, but I remember clear as day, uh, the first time I actually got drunk and high, it was marijuana and old Milwaukee's best ice. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it was a six pack, six uh, point two top shelf percent. stuff, dude. Yeah, yeah. Top yeah shelf. the hardcore Schaefer um, beer. <laughs> you remember that shit out there? Yeah. In the East. yeah, that was really big on Labatt's. Yeah, I remember the first beer I ever sipped was a St. Pauli girl, and then um, my buddy's dad gave us a Labatt's. Wow, uh, Labatt's blue. Um, <laughs> I actually like that one, but uh, <laughs> but yeah, I remember clear as day. I was hanging with my buddy Tim Bennett, and uh, it was the summer, and I was in Rensselaer Falls, New York. And we drank a six pack of Old Milwaukee's Best Ice, and then we smoked some weed and cooked some venison. And I remember laying on a picnic table, looking up at the stars. Everything was just spinning, but I felt great and was like, "I don't ever not want to feel like this again." Oh man! And uh, basically, from that point forward, for seventeen and like three quarters years, 
I uh, pretty much drank and used every single day. So when we ask this to everybody too, I mean, growing up, were you diagnosed with any ADHD or any learning disabilities or anything like that to where medicine was introduced to you um, at a young age or, you know, uh, you had trouble concentrating and or recluse, not good in, mm-hmm. um, you know, crowds to yeah. where, hey, that drinking and stuff opened you up to, you know, where you could flourish, you uh, know. So I did get diagnosed with, I want to say depression as a kid. Mm-hmm. Um, and they prescribed me Seroquel. Oh, which, so young too. Yeah. Uh, which, I mean, Seroquel is technically, if you look it up, it, it is technically an antipsychotic. And so yeah. like yeah. my mom kind of freaked out and was like, no, my son's not a psycho. He, yeah. you know, he's just depressed. He's got these issues mom know. Look at him now. Yeah. Jeffrey Dahmer. <laughs> There's actually a really good, yeah, really that good new one on Netflix shit, right now about Dahmer. We're watching that right now. Really good. Yeah, man. Um, do you think that you know that the depression stemmed from you know the situation with your mom and dad divorcing? It was probably a culmination of that and having moved around a lot and still not ever feeling like I ever connected with anybody. Yeah, I could imagine, um, man. Hard to making friends yeah, and shit. Going to starting over schools. all the time. Yeah, some trauma stuff that happened. I mean, the first time. Um, I was about 10, and uh, ironically enough, I was with my friend Tim Bennett uh, staying at his house. He was raised by a single mom, so him and I always had this connection because he lived like half a mile down the road from me, so I just walked down the train tracks to his house. Mm -hmm. Um, But uh, his mom ended up uh, molesting me, and I never told anybody about that until, you know, I got sober, so I carried that around forever. Um, That impacted, like, why is, you know, why is a woman doing this to me? I'm a 10-year-old kid. Yeah. You know, it's my friend's mom. She knows my mom. I know the son. We hang out. Like, is this going to be weird? Um, And so kind of like after that, I kind of started to distance myself from him. And, you know, he didn't understand why. Yeah. And so like now I'm lying to my friend, like my best friend growing up of like, hey, I can't come over. You know, your mom molested me, but I can't tell you that. Mm -hmm. And that impacted, you know, how I kind of viewed women, even my own mom, how I treated women for for most of my life. And then... uh, I got a little bit older and I was about 13 or 14 and there was a a male teacher in school that uh that molested me. Um ironically enough he used to tase me and shit. But uh wow. you know, I I mean that was looking back on it like I should have known better, like I should have said something, but you can't see it in that moment. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's I should have never, you know, it's never right for an adult or a teacher or anybody in a yeah. position of power to say, "Hey, come to my house." We can do an extra credit assignment. Well, yeah, and a child should never be yeah, put the, in that fucking position. What the know? fuck was the extra credit? Getting tased? Like, getting tased uh, in my genitals, getting tased in my armpits, getting tased on my head, getting wow, man. having to do sexual acts on him. And uh, like more so than the first one, you know, like I've told people some stories about get, like, you know, they're like, you can't get molested by a woman. That's, you know, that's not gay. And I was like, well. Have you ever been molested by a woman as a child? No. Well, then you don't know what it's like and, and how bad did that messes you up, yeah, exactly. especially being raised by a single mom. And then the dude, you know, that really messed me up because then I was like, well, why is this stuff happening? Happening. Yeah. Like, why am I responding the same way I do with girls to a male? Like, am I gay? Do I like men? What's really going on here? And, uh, of course, I cannot tell anybody about 13, that. 13, 14 yeah. years old is when 13, you're 13, 14 that. years old. And uh, you're already struggling with, you know, going through puberty and, you know, mixed emotions and shit and how bad something like that just fucks with you. And the fact that your mom and dad split, you really didn't have a male figure in your life, your brother, yeah. but that's different than, yeah. say, a teacher who is trusted and, you know, you put these this faith in and then all of a sudden you're going through all this shit that you got to sift through in your head. Yeah. Yeah, man. Yeah, I never really processed any of it. I really just, you know, I started, like I said, when I was 12, and I'm pretty much smoking weed or, you know, pretty much daily and then drinking on the weekends and, yeah. you know, other other drugs, you know, painkillers, meds that friends' parents had. And you found that suppressed those yeah. feelings and just I didn't made have it to, to where you could anything. function. Mm-hmm. So, so when did you, because we deal with a lot of people that, especially in nowadays, that come through with trauma of all different walks of life. So how how did you eventually work through that or, you know, or process that? Because you obviously, you know, for whatever reasons, just suppressed it for so long. But like, was there kind of a process that after that, or like when you went through recovery that how, how you 
you know, process through that to accept that and kind of move forward and, and, and grow? That's a great question. Um, for me, like, I, again, I never really thought about, I didn't want to think about it for forever. And, uh, you know, I had to work, I started working a 12 step program and, and it was, uh, in a 12 step meeting. Um, when I was in treatment, I had about three weeks in treatment and, uh, it was the meeting and they broke down into this little small group after, and they just started talking about telling the truth and being honest. Mm. And, uh, I don't know why I couldn't, I wasn't going to tell anybody about that, that stuff yet, man. I still hadn't made my mind up if I was going to tell, you know, this little, little short fat dude who was my sponsor about this stuff and, uh, came around to me. And all of a sudden I just felt like this pressure in my toes and I just started spewing. Yeah. And I just went on for like seven minutes. And as I was talking, I kind of feel like I get chills talking about it. Like I could just feel this weight being lifted. Yeah. You know, I could just feel this pressure just kind of go from my toes up my leg, you know, through my body, you know, through my arms. And like once I finished and kind of like breathed, I just felt relief because mm. it was the first time I'd ever in my whole life talked to anybody about anything like that. And it was 12 complete strangers who knew me, you know, didn't know me from a hole in the wall. And so, yeah, so finally talking about it, realized that nobody judged me, right? Nobody chastised me for that. Mm -hmm. People actually cared about me as a result of going through that. People said, hey, I've been through the same thing. And I realized that that was the start of, okay, maybe I can, you know, address this. I'm not mm -hmm. the only one who's ever been, you know, even though you see it on the news and you read it in books or you learn about these things, you still get this feeling in the sense that you're the only one who's ever yeah. experienced this type of specific abuse. So yeah. that was the first time you told anybody about mm -hmm. it and you told a room full of 12 people mm -hmm. like, uh, and you said that was like the first time you felt relief. Mm -hmm. Was it just like 50 million pounds just being lifted off yeah. you to yeah, where imagine. like you felt like for once you could fucking breathe? Yeah. I went up to my room and cried. Yeah. I, I don't really... I mean, I was actually talking to somebody about this the other day. I think there's probably 10 people in my life who've seen me cry. Yeah. You know, and that's like my mom and my brother, I don't really count them, but there's a handful of people who've ever seen me cry. And at that point, you know, I just left and just went up and cried and, yeah. and just was like, it's going to be okay. You know, didn't know how I was going to process through it now that it's out there, yeah. you know, because now that it's not being suppressed by substances mm -hmm. and the booze and the alcohol and the cocaine and, you know, the women and the lying and the cheating and the manipulating. Now I actually got to deal with it. Yeah. Which yeah. kind of happened like by accident. Cause like, I don't think I was ready to deal with it, but again, I was ready to deal with it. If that makes any sense. Yep. Cause yeah. I don't believe looking back on it, that it, that if I had waited any longer, if I would have even talked, I don't, I don't know. How old were you when you uh, finally opened up? Uh, 30. So it was, geez, 17 well, years yeah, of crazy. like holding that years. shit in. Yeah, yeah dude. And, and it's crazy to me too. You know, I, I think about what you're saying and the situations from different clients that we've met throughout the years. Being in this field, it, it's horrible, mm -hmm. especially as, as for children to have to experience and have to go through stuff like that. And some way, somehow, the children end up feeling like like they're at fault, mm -hmm. you know, like, like, you know, they're embarrassed, they're afraid. So, you know, my biggest thing using this platform to be able to speak to people is if there is anybody out there listening that this may be something that is hitting them in the heart, his story, listening to his testimony. Just remember, part of healing is expressing that stuff from the inside and not being afraid to open it up because at the end of the day, you know, it's, it's so much deeper than pride and all of these things that we're trying to save people's mm -hmm. lives here, yeah, absolutely. you know, and, and find that the community, people that love and care about you. I mean, I'm sure that all played a part in you opening up about all of this. Yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, I mean, that's my home. That's where I got sober. That's, that's where my whole, this whole chapter in my life started, mm -hmm. you know, cause I checked into rehab on my 30th birthday. And, on your 30th? Uh, on my 30th birthday, 6th, uh, or August 8th, 2016 is when I checked into and treatment. that was the first time you ever been? First time I ever went to treatment, mm -hmm. you know, because, uh, I mean, again, I'm from, being from a really small town, really small community, yeah. you know, I'm sure there were a lot of people, um, you know, my friend's parents were alcoholics and or addicts. Mm -hmm. I'm almost certain of it, but it wasn't like walking or driving down the street to Tucson or Phoenix yeah. Yeah. where it's right in front of your face everywhere you go basically yeah. mm -hmm. and, so uh, so for you that stuff happened at 13 and 14 mm -hmm. you stayed and you graduated high school in new york mm -hmm. where did you go after so i moved 
I moved around. I love uh, food. I mean, who no. doesn't love food? No. Yeah. yeah. No. I love That's why food. we're friends, what? bro. I love to cook. And uh, so I went to <laughs> culinary school. Um, I mean, I had went to a couple different colleges. Um, How many? <laughs> <laughs> I think all in all, uh, in my lifetime, I've been to like nine Nine different colleges? Nice. Nine um, degrees, ladies and gentlemen. Nine degrees. No, not even <laughs> close. Uh, maybe nine credits. Um, no, hey, I mean, that was... But you tried. Yeah. I did try. You know what yep. I mean? I tried to go and basically just meet people to to sell drugs to. That was my MO for, for what I was doing that for. But, <laughs> wow. uh, Culinary school. So then it's like restaurant biz. Mm-hmm. Right in restaurant business, I saw Waiting. Love that movie. Yeah. <laughs> Great, Great movie. movie. I I worked in a restaurant too Apostle early Spence. on, and nope, that's one of the best places to find drugs. Absolutely, mm-hmm. you know, Alcohol. and drink, mm-hmm. um, and all that stuff. So you you did culinary, and then where'd you go from culinary? That was my first actual instance where the life that I was leading with doing drugs and drinking and mm-hmm. using. Because prior to that, growing up in that small town, I had gotten in trouble. But there was never any consequences for it. Yep. Like I was, you know, stealing stuff and, you know, petty larceny and you know, doing all this other stuff. But I never had any real consequences. Mm-hmm. There was no probation. I never actually was arrested. And so when I was in culinary school, I ended up getting arrested for fraud, forgery, identity mm-hmm. theft, and and larceny. Wow. And in New York, I was looking at two class A felonies and like 10 to 15 years in prison as a 20-year-old male. And part of me felt 20-year-old like... 20-year-old male. Yeah. Part of me wanted to to go to prison, right? To have a stop or an end. Yeah. yeah. I was like, you know, I've watched enough documentaries. I think I'll be all right. Mm-hmm. I'm not a small dude. I'll, I'll be able to manage, like, whatever. Check the biggest yeah. dude in the yard yeah, as soon as you get there. Let's see what we got to <laughs> do. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I know some people. Some of my friends are in prison. Maybe I'll go there. and uh, Completely acidine crazy thinking. That's yeah. crazy. <laughs> For a 20-year-old. Right. That's, you know, yeah. I mean, people who know me now, like, that. But you would survive. not survive in prison. <laughs> uh, you're a big teddy bear. Um, but so, yeah, I mean, that that stuff happened, and uh, I had to deal with some consequences of that. Mm-hmm. Um, I will say, in my belief system, um, I thought I was kind of getting away with something when I didn't end up going to prison. I ended up, because it was the first time I'd ever been arrested, arrested, and uh, I ended up getting five years probation. And again, I thought I was just, you know... Uh, to me, that was a slap on the wrist. Ten years in prison or five years probation. I mean, I'm pretty sure you, we know what most people are going to take, mm-hmm. honestly. And um, that just taught me, you know, like how long drugs stayed in my system. <laughs> that taught me what substances I could use, you know. <laughs> and, and that's really when alcohol was like a primary, like became an everyday substance in my life. Because I knew I could go and drink and not have to worry about Drug substances tests. staying in my system because they didn't test me for alcohol in my urine. And this they is still in New York where you got oh, yeah. arrested. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so this is in New York. I ended up completing probation in two years because apparently I was a model probationee, but they didn't know I was still drinking every day and still robbing people and still committing crimes. Wow. I just didn't do it on the level I was doing. I realized I'm not good at fraud and forgery, uh-huh. and uh, I don't need to be doing that anymore, so let's just stick stick to other stuff from there i moved to arizona mm. uh for about a year my whoop brother whoop. Was, brother's in the military do you still have any friends or anyone that you've like met throughout those times or have you always been like going from spot to spot never so i where i grew up i think i talked to like a kid who was like three grades below me that i used to sell drugs to <laughs> um about six months ago i don't really talk to anybody like i yeah. went to high school with wow. um most of the kids from like the culinary school, I'm friends with one who still lives in New Orleans, which is what got me there, but I don't really talk to any of them. Yeah. Um, moving out here to Arizona that first time, I don't know any, I don't talk to any of those people anymore. I was just curious. I wasn't yeah. sure, you know, if you had like one buddy that you kept with or something. And like that was that. a question too I was going to ask is like um, what you went through, you know, with the friend's mom mm-hmm. and then the teacher confiding in a friend. Mm-hmm. Over the years, did you ever like think about sharing it with somebody you were close to at all, or it just never crossed your mind? Because that, I mean, to me, I'm thinking that is such a 
I mean, I get we want to keep stuff, but eventually when we start feeling comfortable with people, you know, it's like opening up. Were you ever yeah. in that position or had a relationship with a, a friend that you felt like, hey, I might be able to open up about this to somebody? There was one. His name's Chris, and I met him out here, and we used to party together, and, you know, we connected, and I almost did one time when I was high on cocaine, mm -hmm. but... uh I just said, no, I can't because he's my friend. I'm going to lose him as a friend. And I don't want him to think, I don't want him stuff. to think, you know, yeah. Yeah. I don't want this to go south. Like, even though it was a toxic friendship, <laughs> I'd still rather have a toxic friendship than no friendship at all because yeah. Yeah. I had codependency issues <laughs> and I need people in my life because I'm, yeah. I don't know how to function without people around. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but no, I, I never, Man. never once, like, yeah. It, Looking at it now, it's like, like, man, I don't, I don't know why, like, I didn't tell anybody, Yeah, you know, like I had an instance when I moved to new, I was living in New Orleans and, uh, and the teacher, uh, actually reached out to me on Facebook. What the fuck? And, uh, the guy that did the, molest the guy that, that molested me. Yeah. He reached out to me on Facebook messenger and, you know, just asked me how I was doing and like, what's going on. And like, I instantly just was like, I know what you did. It was messed up please leave me alone. And, uh, how did that feel? Did it like paralyze you yeah. for a moment? Like I can't even imagine. I instantly left and went and got, got loaded and was like, what a sick, wow. fuck. you know, no, like, like ill feelings. Like I want to kill this guy or fucking like any of that kind of stuff for a long time. I did. Yeah. I mean, I can say now sitting here, you know, I'm doing this podcast. Like I don't, I don't want to kill the man. I, I know me killing the man is just going to result in me going to prison, mm -hmm. and I don't want to do that now. Um, but for a very, 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 pretty much ever since it happened, I didn't uh, didn't care if I had a, if he had to tried it again. Once it got to a certain point, I would have I would be in prison. But um, I just don't, you know, it's something I kind of just blacked out and just pushed way down and buried and buried yeah. and buried and buried. When that happened, I was like 24, 23. It just brought all that. It shit. brought everything back up. And kind of like kickstarted everything again in New Orleans on, you know, going harder and not wanting to address that. You know, it's crazy. You said, I don't know why I didn't tell anybody, you know, but in reality, I've always thought, you know, we were 18. We're, we're considered adults. Mm -hmm. Most of us don't know shit at 18. I know I didn't know shit at 18. I'm still trying to, like, figure things out. You know, you should have never been put in that position in the first place. Yeah. So those thoughts of like, you know, I don't know why I never did. Bro, you were never supposed to fucking be in that position mm -hmm. to begin with. And then having to deal with the addiction that you shouldn't have having been dealt with. To, and, and then the medications and everything. Like, it's just it's just crazy to hear because I know there's so many kids and there's so many people out there that are going through the exact mm -hmm. same type of shit, you know? Yeah. I mean, if I could say anything to y'all, it's, you know, fucked up shit does happen. Mm -hmm. And I sincerely know what you're going through and know what you're feeling and know what's going through your head, even though your parents probably don't know or your boyfriend probably doesn't know or your girlfriend doesn't know or your kids don't know or, or nobody knows. Um, but holding it in isn't going to, it's not going to help you. It, it's not even about the person that abused you at this point because mm -hmm. once it happens, I can't change that, right? And I got to the point in my recovery when I started to actually process through it and address it and say, from this point forward, the, the cat's out of the bag. You've talked about it. So from this point forward, the more you let that have power over you, the more he's still controlling you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so if you want to heal and part of healing, which is going to be a process, you know, and it's different for everybody, um, but you need to address it and you need to come to terms with the fact that this did happen. Yeah. We can't change it. And how do we move forward being a better person you know, and not letting what he did control your life and control how you yeah. think and control how you feel about yourself and control how you treat people. And that's really important because we we know it, right? Uh, like I said before, there's so many people that have gone through trauma, you know, in adulthood, childhood, stuff like that. A lot of the times all we hear about are the females that go through this type of stuff, mm -hmm. right? Um, we as men, I think, have been trained and told as society that, you know, you need to keep that stuff you know, you need to not be vulnerable and not show your emotions and, you know, you need to deal with it and, and move on. Right. But it, it's it happens to men just as much, you know, as it happens to females. Right. And there's I can guarantee a lot of dudes that might be out there struggling right now that have been going through this kind of stuff and don't know what to do and are struggling with that. Like, you know, I don't 
want to be looked down upon or made fun of and, and stuff like that. But mm-hmm. like you said, like, you know, all it's doing is letting that control them more. And it's, we, we see people, you know, take their lives and stuff yep. on a daily basis, you know, and it, it's, it's just rough. So I, I you know, I, it's very important. I think that you share that because, you know, if anyone does hear this and, and, and is struggling, like hopefully that, yeah, you know, man. can kind of point them in the right direction. Can reach out. It's so real. And if a friend is really a friend, dude, they're going to be there to listen. Like yeah. anyone who fucking it decides to cut you off because you confided in them, like that's not a real friend yeah. to begin with. It's going back to those, that voice in your head that lies to you. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. My own worst enemy is me. Right. Shit. And I, I fully believe that. Yeah. You know, through, through talking with people and, and hearing others' experience, like I came to realize that, like, sure what happened to me and, and what i went through and the things i even the things i did throughout my using and abusing yeah um it's not really shit honestly mm-hmm. and, and i don't that might sound a little crazy to some people but i got people in my life right now whose story makes mine looks like you know sunshine yeah and and to see that these people were people in my life that had processed through it and had made it out the other side Mm -hmm. and had talked about it and had actually addressed it. They were the example, right? Because I didn't have that male role model. My brother, I forgot to mention, my brother's in recovery too, right? And we used to party together. Um, He's had some stuff happen in his life, you know, trauma stuff. Um, Did you know about that early on or not until late? Not until I got sober. Mm. Again, I I got a lot of bombshells dropped on me about – my family and my childhood and my life (laughs) um, once I got sober. And, you know, for me that having been raised by my mom and it was basically my mom, my brother and I for 18 years, like to realize that he dealt with the same stuff I was going through. And like, I know why we used to fight as bad as we did and why he, you know, would throw chairs at me and why I would, Mm -hmm. you know, chase him around the house with knives and he'd throw Mm -hmm. knives at me. And like, I get it. Like, it makes sense now. Good old knife party. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, you know, um, butcher knives. Um, You know, but at the same time, we, you know, we would fight like violently and then we'd cover up for each other to our mom. Yeah. You know? That's how it works. Yeah. You know? And all that being said, too, I mean, you, you shared about, you know, alcohol and the marijuana and the cocaine. Like, that was like your vice. Like, you know, if you were going to say, hey, you know, I'm more of an alcoholic or I'm more of a cocaine addict. What is what was it that for you that's, hey, that's my main vice? Like, is it the alcohol? That's oh, Man, I got to pick between my two loves. Well, you don't. You can love to. Um, <laughs> not more the better. You know, monogamous substance use, or non-monogamous. <laughs> I guess it would be. Um, I mean, <laughs> I mean, it was always alcohol. Like it got to the point at the end where it was pretty much always alcohol and cocaine every single night. You so know? It was, you were never an opiate guy. You know, I mean, you know how the recovery world works. It's yeah. Like, hey, we're you know we're opiate addicts yeah. over here, and you don't understand us because you're a cocaine addict. Uh, pretty much alcohol and cocaine yeah. and touching base on what he just said like that. Even when I came to treatment, um, cause I came to treatment from new Orleans and, um, I mean, yeah, I lived out here for like a year, but I pretty much just drank and did drugs every day. So I never really like Jeez. saw Phoenix. I was pretty much secluded to like Litchfield park and McDowell all the way up to like surprise an old good old el mirage yeah an el mirage which <laughs> one of my best friends is from el mirage and you know turns out that he lived like two houses down from where i lived and i could have gotten cheaper and better drugs the whole time i was out here <laughs> but you know is that number 17 i was stuck going to <laughs> yeah um but no i pretty much would say alcohol and, yeah. and again moving out here and going to treatment i for initially I felt like everybody was different because everybody yeah. was using heroin. Yeah. Heroin and meth. And I was like, yeah. I mean, I did heroin in New Orleans for about a month and I loved it, but I couldn't function. Yeah. Like I like even with alcohol, like I can function to an extent and I do mm-hmm. enough cocaine, it'll bring me up off the floor. <laughs> um and so, you know, I tried <clears throat> heroin and I, I fully understand what people were talking about, but to me, I was able to stop doing heroin, mm-hmm. which again kind of boggles my mind. Like, how did I just stop doing heroin? Yeah. But couldn't stop but couldn't stop doing alcohol. cocaine or alcohol. Yeah. I was listening to a podcast, uh Steve has a podcast mm-hmm. and they had Corey Taylor from Slipknot on there. Yeah. And he was saying like they they pretty much considered him like Nikki Six. 
And he said that he was doing all of this shit. And he goes, I don't know what it was. He goes, I never went to a rehab. I never did any of that. I was never involved in AA or any of that. He goes, I just one day was just able to say like, fuck this. I'm not doing it anymore. He goes, and I understand that some people can do it. He goes, and I'm grateful that I, I was able to. He goes, but I also understand like a lot of people don't have Most that. people can't. Yeah, they can't fucking do it. Yeah. And he did it for a long time. You if know? it was that simple, then we wouldn't be sitting here having this podcast. Yeah, There'd absolutely. be no need for a treatment a treatment center or treatment center. So when like you got recovery. into, you know, treat recovery the first mm-hmm. time, that's the only time you've, mm-hmm. you know, you've had to go to treatment one time and you've stayed on the straight and narrow for your own recovery path. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, Six and years then now. did you did you work at all with like any kind of counselor or psychologist or anything for the the horrible shit that you had to go through? Me personally, I did not. So I went to a treatment center in Phoenix and there was no like trauma counselor or anything mm-hmm. like that. It was pretty much a substance abuse treatment center and I processed through all my stuff with a 12 step sponsor. That's been my primary yeah the way i did that and again i know it worked for me it some people do require outside services due mm-hmm. to the severity of of what they they process through and yeah you know i don't think i'm special because that's the only thing i had to do um but that's I was what just, worked for yeah you. that's what worked for me mm-hmm. and it was just you know finally actually talking about it and facing it yeah and realizing that like hey i'm okay yeah like this define it it's part of me and, and i can't ever take me take that away yeah but it doesn't define me as a person mm-hmm. you know like i don't need to walk around and just be like hey i'm my name's jefferson i'm i've been molested twice yeah right? like, my balls were tased yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know and a, a, quick, a real quick question for me is like that age 30 years old was there a significance of why you did you just make a decision like at 30 i'm gonna go or what made you want to go into treatment so at that point i was living in new orleans I had left Arizona, um, kind of just backtrack a little. I had uh, lived out here for about a year and some change. My brother was overseas. He was in the Air Force. And uh, let's just say I wasn't a very good brother when he was gone. Okay. You know, I, I did the things addicts do and pawn stuff and sold stuff. Oh, and, man. And, uh, but my logic was he's family. He's going to love me anyways. And he's in the military and he's going to, you know, pay for it because he's talking about getting all these this money and like it's going to take care of itself. It did, but that doesn't make it right. So your brother had gotten sober at this time? No, he was still getting loaded. Oh, yeah, okay. We were still uh, partying when he came back. Um, We used to frequent uh, gentlemen's clubs in the Phoenix area every weekend, and we're kind of weekend warriors. He was a weekend warrior because he was in the military, Yeah, but I was every day. And so hanging out with him and doing that was just kind of like the the fun part, you know, because I get to hang out with my brother, we get to do this. We're sharing life. You know, we're always going to be doing this together. And um, anyways, that all happened. And and I get a phone call one day. And like a week later, I'm in New Orleans working in the kitchen. I did various restaurants in New Orleans. And um, it got to a point where I was working at a country club just outside of New Orleans. And uh, it was the busiest weekend of the year. Had a big golf tournament coming in. And uh, we were supposed to, they paid for me and my coworkers to stay in a hotel mm. because we had to be there at about three in the morning. And I decided that, hey, I still want to go out and shoot pool and drink, <laughs> but I don't want to go do it alone. So I convinced my buddy to come with me and I proceeded to get obliterated drunk as fast as I could because it was 10 o'clock and we needed to be back by four. So I figured if I stopped drinking by about three, I'd be all right. You know, <laughs> needless to say, uh, I ended up getting a DWI. Oh, man. And, uh you know, I got the field sobriety test and I failed and they, you know, cops said, I'm putting you under arrest for driving while intoxicated and you're going to jail. And I remember sitting in the back of the cop car and it was the first time I did feel some sort of relief because I knew that my life and what I had been doing for so long was about to come crashing down. It's like I had built this giant house of cards. I'm famous for doing that in my own like sense of Mm -hmm. building stuff up. And usually about a year later, I I burn the house of cards down and then I run. Yeah. And then I do it again and then I burn it down and I run. Um, And so in New Orleans, I was kind of the the straw that broke the camel's back. So let's say, Um, and I got a DWI and uh, and I told the cop, thank you (laughs) for giving me a DWI. Mm. I don't know why. It's like, are you mocking me, boy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nightstick taser. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a flashback right there. Um, 
and, and yeah, I ended up getting a DWI. Mm-hmm. Um, it's crazy in the state of Louisiana for your first DWI or DUI offense. Seventy five dollars bonded out. That's seventy five seventy five dollars. Going to New Orleans. Five bucks. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jeez. So long story short, I got I got bonded out later that day and went and worked at the country club that night for the event. Wow. And uh, after work, I ended up drinking and driving home. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. a, like a good alcoholic. Right. And uh and stayed out and never went home that night because I knew having been arrested before, I know that lawyers start sending out paperwork or like, hey, let let me represent you, do yeah. your legal case to the family. And uh, I knew that with because of the address on my ID, they were gonna start sending it to my girl's house. Oh. And once she found that out because her previous relationship was with an alcoholic and she despised them that this oh, man. this was about to be all bad yeah, and so i just an end. let's avoid let's avoid it if i'm just not home i can just play it off and just maybe <laughs> intercept the mail do like the you know middle schooler intercept the report the card pink, yeah the report card that's the pink crazy. slip or whatever yeah. um anyway she found out and uh for the first time i became homeless i became basically unemployed i became what i thought was an addict and an alcoholic, right? Because that's another big contributing factor that I think a lot of people don't realize is that alcoholism and addiction come in all different forms. It's not just Mm -hmm. the person that's on the street corner flying the sign. It's not just the person in the Circle K that's, you know, picked out their face. It's the person in Circle K who's got the six pack that's wearing the business suit that you don't realize. Mm-hmm. Or the person who got off the city bus. That got off the city bus. Or the yeah. CEO. Yeah. 15. Yeah. Or the CEO doing 15. lines of cocaine all yeah. day up in the yeah. top of yeah. a, It doesn't yeah. discriminate. It comes in all shapes and forms, all walks of life. And forever, I thought that addiction and alcoholism and that meant it was the person that I just described that yeah. was applying the sign in this. And I'd always kept a job, right? Because I had two to three different lives, basically. I was keeping a job. I was trying to be this person for the girlfriend but i was also hanging out with the friends committing crimes yeah wow and so it gets tiring no i get it it's living all those different lives right mm-hmm. eventually it comes up catches up to you and you're just fucking tired and i'm sure when you got in that cup you're like thank you and it's yeah. like uh, mm-hmm. a sign yeah. of relief right yeah. that's crazy and that's- so when that was the dui you came out after that, obviously, yeah. and, and that's when you started your journey through yeah. treatment. Yeah, so my um, my DWI was uh, June 10th, 2016. And when did you come out here? I came out here August. I flew out to Arizona August 5th. It was a Friday night, and I ended up staying with my brother for the weekend because I couldn't get into Crossroads where I went to treatment uh-huh. um, until uh, Monday morning. So obviously the girl found out, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> and that put a squash to that. Mm-hmm. So it's like, hey, bucket, I'm going to head back to Arizona. I got nothing here. Mm-hmm. Start well, that, my life. It wasn't just like me making that decision because at first I was like, all right, I can deal with this. Like, I'm homeless. Mm-hmm. I'll figure it out. I'll go get another job. There's thousands of restaurants here. I know enough people. I'll find somebody to let me rent a room or I'll get my own apartment, but I can still drink and I can still party. Like, I've beaten probation once, I'll beat it again. <laughs> You know, and, it was just uh, a mistake. One time mistake. I'm, yeah. I'm not going to do that I'm shit. I'm going to do it again. And then I realized really quick that I don't want to be homeless in New Orleans in the middle of summer. Oh, man. Yeah. I don't want to be riding. Like, I like riding a bike, but I don't want to be riding a bike everywhere. I don't want to have to worry about where my next meal is going to come or my next shower is going to yep. come. And like, I'm not going to stop drinking and I'm not mm-hmm. going to stop using if I don't do something different. But I didn't know what. And I still didn't want to reach out to my brother to ask for help even though by this point he was sober and god bless my ex-girlfriend's heart she uh she posted something on facebook just about how i was you know a piece of shit and a horrible person (laughs) wow um and a liar and a cheater and a thief and a scumbag and all this and uh my sister-in-law saw it and uh my brother reached out to me and just asked me what was going on and and i told him and you know he's like i don't know why he didn't reach out but like i'm here to help you know i'm going through the I've gone through the same thing you have, you know? And so like kind of instantaneously, I felt like, okay, my brother can do this. Maybe I can't, maybe. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And he, you know, through a series of events, he got me in touch with some people and a gentleman who's now my sponsor that tricked me into coming out here to Arizona to get sober. (laughs) He tricked Um, you? Yeah. He just asked me a bunch of yes or no questions. And like one of the questions in the middle was, do you want to come out to Phoenix and get sober and change your life? And apparently I said yes. And, uh, by the end of the conversation, he was like, all right, I need you to take pictures of your your arresting your arrest report and get all your legal documents and send me pictures. I'm going to help you out. 
and we're going to get this legal stuff handled. And then once we do that, we're going to get you out here. And uh, wow. I can say, I don't know how, but he made some phone calls and talked to some people. And I showed up to court a couple different times. But the most recent court, the the last court date I showed up to, they were just like, yep, you're going to be on you know, unsupervised probation and you got to go up next door to the probation department and fill out all this paperwork. And I get there and they're like, yeah, we know you're going to Phoenix, Arizona. We know you're going to go check into treatment. Like we're cool with it. You know, most people don't realize they have a problem. Even though I still wasn't convinced I had a problem, I knew I needed to do something different. Yeah. Um, and I didn't know I really wanted to be sober, sober because I, I thought treatment was just a place to get better and then learn how to actually say no like the dare program was supposed to teach me <laughs> or do uh, drugs right or do drugs yeah right. no shit yeah. oh so maybe, this is what it looks like yeah maybe you're going to rehab, heroin wrong you're a quitter yeah <laughs> basically you know. that was like my thought forever yeah um and i ended up you know coming out here and when did you start working in recovery about a month six weeks sober gotcha. six weeks Dang. sober i got i got a I went to that treatment center in, in Phoenix, and uh, one of the gentlemen who's on this podcast um, came and asked me if I wanted to volunteer because he was he was already volunteering slash working there. And, and that sponsor I had just said, just say yes to anything people ask you to do. Like, they're not going to ask you to go rob nothing or commit no crimes. Like, Well, that depends. Just, just say yes. <laughs> he, obviously, um, he didn't break it down on point for you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was naive. You know, um, which is good, though. Yeah. I mean, it gets you where you are today, right? Yeah. And uh, and I, I said yes, and then a couple other people asked me to volunteer, and I said yes, and then I just showed up one Sunday morning with a notebook because I wanted to be the overachiever and make sure <laughs> I did shit right. Heck and, yeah. uh, you know, that turned into like a night manager position and then assistant program coordinator and a group facilitator teaching like residential treatment stuff. And That's great. Admissions. And so do you sponsor people today? Yes, I do. You do? Yeah. And do you, how many meetings and things do you do a week? Not that I care. I'm just wondering, like, everybody's different. Yeah, yeah. So you know? for me, um, I go to approximately two to three. I mean, I have two pretty regular ones. Mm -hmm. um, there's another one that happens every night at, like, 10 8 p.m. that I was going to. I kind of go in spurts to that one. Yeah. Like, you know, I don't really feel like staying up till 1130 because I know that yeah. after we're, they're going to want to get food. And I know mm -hmm. I can say no, but I'm a fat kid and I want to go eat after. <laughs> no judgment. It's going to be good. Yeah. And so, you know, I go to that meeting. I mean, there was nice. a period where I was going to, to a lot more, uh -huh. you know, and everybody's got to find what works for them. Yeah. You know, like I don't believe for me personally and in, in my belief system, going to meetings isn't enough. Like going to meetings is great and it's part of my recovery. But if I didn't have, you know, a sponsor where I wasn't sponsoring dudes or living my life the way that I'm supposed to be by not lying to people and not yeah. cheating people and not hurting people, um, which sound pretty easy to do for most people. But it's for a lot. me, yeah. that's a lot. Like, mm -hmm. you mean I got to not try and hit this person with my car because they cut me off? <laughs> I mean, I got to not lie to, you know, yeah. not steal the money that's just sitting on the table? Like, yeah. sometimes it's like, well, I, you know. But, like, I don't really, like, even think about doing those things anymore. It's, like, second nature. Like, this is the right thing to do. The right thing is very obvious to me. Yeah. Instant and, gratification. We you got to get rid of yeah. that instant gratification. Which is hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Even, I mean, even normies. Yeah, whatever, no, for sure. Yeah. Whatever normal is, right? Like, we, everybody likes yeah. to get that result right away. Yeah. Right? Doesn't matter yeah, if you're in around. recovery or not. Yeah. But I think you start learning, too, like, it really is the reward at the end of it for being patient and having those types of things and seeing like little by little, I mean, getting into this recovery process, this didn't happen overnight. You know what I mean? I'm sure there's a lot of fear and stuff you mm -hmm. dealt with mm -hmm. but little by little. You realized it was worth it. Yeah. You yeah. Know? It was like everything in my life right now is a result of getting sober. My life be like, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I think you love your job. Like for you, I think working in recovery mm -hmm. helps your personal recovery, mm -hmm. right? It does me too. We're a lot alike. Yeah. You know what I mean? And um, you've, you've excelled on all kinds of things. You have such a great story to be able to help a lot of people who struggle, who've been through that type of situation. Mm -hmm. I can't relate, but I know a lot of people, you know, can relate to that. And um, I, I've known a lot of people in recovery where they've been in recovery for 10, 15 years, and then mm -hmm. they have shared that. That's how much wow. guilt or shame or scared about that type of situation, molestation, right, that they have suppressed even through being in sobriety forever and working mm -hmm. on themselves. You know, yeah. they're still 
holding on to that, you know, and, and yep. to me, it makes me view you as a very strong person and, 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 uh, it's a very good reminder and, and thing for me to see that from you. And I, I appreciate that transparency and that honesty Yeah, thank you, that, man. uh, you're able to share because I don't know if I could do that. You know, I got, I got scared shitless. I got scared shitless when I came into treatment that if I didn't do what this little dude said, I mean, I'm just assuming the worst. You know, because that's pretty much how I lived my life was... Be like, mm, whatever. <laughs> can we start the... I'm just like, can we start the podcast? Can we get that loop? That'd be please? great. Can we get that loop? That's the sound effect. So if, you know, I mean, you sitting here and being able to no telling who's going to be listening to this, what is like the one absolute for you that you would say, this has to be an absolute if you want to have any kind of success, successful life. And I'm not talking about monetary or anything like that. I'm just talking about being successful as a human being. Mm -hmm. what, what would be the one thing that you would throw out there at like, hey, this is an absolute. There's no cutting corners on this part. For me, I can tell you what mine is and I'll let you go first. That's really hard because like instantly I was like honesty, but like to that's just super honest, you know, I I mean, honestly, I would have to say vulnerability. And that's like a big scary word for men, for women, for anybody. Mm -hmm, you know, yeah. um, by being vulnerable, you're opening yourself up for success and for failure in any endeavor, in any relationship, in any experience. And, and I feel that by doing that, you are getting the full experience in life because you're going to be vulnerable and good stuff's going to happen. Yeah. And I've experienced that and I've been vulnerable and bad shit, happens. bad shit happen. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of the times, you know, a lot of it was by my own doing like, you know, I'm yep. six years sober and, and I'm not sitting here claiming to be fucking choir boy, so to speak. <laughs> uh, like I've made mistakes. You know what I mean? Like I've made some pretty boneheaded decisions in sobriety, but ultimately by being vulnerable about making those mistakes and addressing them mm -hmm. to work on myself, um, I'm still sober. And drinking and using was never, never a thought, you know, for me, like as, as a viable option to solve anything. Like I, maybe it's because I've worked a 12-step program. Maybe it's because I see it constantly on a daily basis working in treatment and pretty much have worked with addicts and alcoholics for the last six years that if I drink or use, this is... I'm going to end up in a treatment center just like this. I'm going to end up being homeless again. I'm going to end mm -hmm. up losing these relationships, whether I do or not. Right. But my head instantly goes to the worst case scenario. Yeah. And if I just stay locked in my shell and not be vulnerable about what's going on with me in my life, you know, and, and the things I'm doing and the things I'm thinking and I'm doomed. And so yep. that's yep. to me, I guess would be the biggest thing would be vulnerability. What'd you have, Matt? Oh, mine's honesty. And only because, you know, for me being dishonest for so long, even nowadays, it's like sometimes I'm like, am I overly honest? Am I being too honest? You know what I mean? And uh, being selfless, too, mm -hmm. I think is a big one. You know, sharing like you're able to share your mm -hmm. story. You know, people might not come up to you and whatever, say anything to you, but they're going to be thinking about that mm -hmm. out and about, and it's probably going to help mm -hmm. them, right? So selfless is in like being able to reach my hand out and help whoever mm -hmm. that needs it and being honest to the point of where you might ask me a question, and you probably you might not like the answer, but at least you know when you ask me something, you're gonna get the truth, yeah. right? And then you know I'm able to be able to close my eyes and sleep and know that I didn't lie to people mm -hmm. that that I re represented myself as as this is who I am, this is what I've been through, this is what I got going on, this is how I feel today, and it's okay, mm -hmm. right? You know, so I think self being selfless today because I was so selfish and being so dishonest, those are two huge ones for me. Mm -hmm. You know, I can't stand people lying to me. That's isn't uh, that it, interesting how that changes? Like when uh, you've lied so much and you like I remember it's fucking just saying stupid shit. It would just come out of my mouth like thinking about that. And now it's I hate. I hate the fact yeah. that, like, when my daughter lies to me, I'm like, dude, don't, don't, do, don't that do that shit. Like, please don't but do that, here's man. Here's the crazy like, irony, though, right? Like, where do we learn to lie? Our parents are lying to us about Santa Claus, Easter Bunny, like, all this shit. We're like, we're wait, being no taught to lie. <laughs> 
There's no you know, Keebler hey, elves. Those aren't real. Santa, mm-hmm. sit on this old man's lap at the fucking store oh, and tell him what you want. You know, but I mean, we're being yeah. taught that being lying is okay. Yeah. Right? You know, and it's like, the, that's the one thing, because you can't, I mean, I'd rather my face be bashed in and I can heal from that compared to being lied to and know that, hey, I have to worry about whether or not Buddha is telling me the truth. Yeah. You know, and um, that bothers me today so bad. It's crazy. You know what I mean? And and I find myself, and I, not on purpose, it's probably subconsciously, but I distance myself from people just because of that. Yeah. There's a there's a box that I have, you know, that uh, circle friend, whatever, meet the parents bullshit, but you got that box <laughs> that people get put in, you know, and, and people get taken out of that box, you know, and they're, they're still friends or acquaintances, but... Um, there's there's a fence there between yeah mm-hmm. and you know what's nuts too dude I, i've i haven't told you this shit but you've mentioned that before a few times where you you said like i would rather my dad beat my ass than him tell me how disappointed he is in me yeah. and i've kept that shit in my head because my son you know I, I have my both of my kids are amazing but you know when we have a boy especially as a man it's just it's a different thing yeah. you know and i know that when i'm scolding him and shit i could just see him dude like he just gets into this like mode Melt. and your voice always comes into my head like he would probably rather me spank his little ass than to be yelling at him so i have to check myself like okay all right, dude, like, I'm sorry that I was being a jerk to you or whatever. Like, I have it's to try not, to do it's that. It's not even the yelling. It's the, like, you know, sitting there like it's a job interview being talked to. Like, you know, my feelings are hurt. So <laughs> yeah. You did this, and I'm really disappointed. And, you know, and it's like, just fucking cold clock me. Yeah. <laughs> Mike Tyson left hook me, please, because yeah. that shit hurts. Yeah. You know? and That's, uh, that's the sharpest knife. Yeah. Yeah, man. I, I can handle the yelling and screaming. I can tell him that shit out. But when it's like, hey, I remember, yeah, dad would call me, hey, son, I need to talk to you. And I'd be like, about what? You know? And it'd be these things. And it would be like so calm and so collective. And I'd be sitting there just wanting to cry and feel like shit, crawl around into that hole, fall, fall that mouse into the wall. <laughs> you know? And because it just made me feel so small and so little, you know? And man, I try not to do that to my kids and stuff, but it's, you know, we do, we did. I never spake my kids' asses or anything like that. It wasn't like a show at Walmart. I go to Walmart to watch that, you know, <laughs> just see motherfuckers getting their asses beat by their parents in Walmart. It's like legal, you know. That's crazy. <laughs> Hilarious, <laughs> but, but not. <laughs> yeah, I just never did that, you know, and it's always been talked to, you know, them like I'm on a on the same level. Yeah. Right? And not try to like make people feel shitty or crappy or whatever. But hey, this is what's going on. This is how I feel and blah blah blah. Yeah. But Thank you, Jefferson, for coming in and sharing. Yeah, dude. No problem. Yeah, man. Thank you so much, bro. Yeah, you, it's amazing. I I really love getting people in here and hearing their testimonies and everything that they go through. Like, I feel like I take something home with me every single time. So I know it takes a lot of strength. You came a long way to yeah. come speak, bro. So thank you. We really, really, really do appreciate that, man. Thank y'all for having me here. You know, it's the first time I've ever spoken on like a podcast or any. You know, I've spoken at meetings and like. Probably more nervous speaking here in front of four people. Why? Well, right now, great man. It's like just sitting here laughing and yeah, having a yeah. great time. Heck yeah, and, you know it's soothing and comfortable. It's beautiful. If you guys heard any background stuff in the back, it rained, rained. right here. We got the window open. It's it's just a beautiful, beautiful day. You just man. lied there, Buddha. The window is closed. <laughs> There's really that nothing going on. It's all bullshit. All. Out of the box. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, thank you guys, you know, for listening once again. You know, this has been another episode of the R-Cast. Please remember that if you guys would like to be on the show, hit us up. I keep getting the email wrong, but I'm going to say it right. It's the R-Cast. 6944 at gmail.com that's t-h-e-a-r-c-a-s-t 6944 at gmail.com we'll get you in here asap please remember that we're on all platforms now guys go ahead and rate us share this with a loved one somebody who may be in recovery whatever it may be and thank you guys again for tuning in every single week comments yes who's the best host absolutely I mean, we want to have a war let's go let's absolutely. go absolutely hey man that's what it let's is go. thank you guys much love you guys have a beautiful weekend and we'll see you next week peace Thank you. Later.
What's going on, everybody? This is Buddha from the Rcast, and I just wanted to thank you for checking out this week's episode. It means a lot, and if you could share it with a friend or a loved one, somebody you need in recovery, or maybe somebody who just needs that little bit of extra positivity in their life, we'd greatly appreciate it. If you would like to join us here on the Rcast, either in the studio live or online, hit us up. The links are down in the show notes of this episode, and on there, you can find direct links to our main website here at America's Rehab Campus and all of our social media platforms. Follow us. We keep the post positive and motivational focused on recovery, health, and wellness. As you know, in this modern day and age, we need as much love as possible, y'all. And as always, if you or somebody you know is in need of substance abuse treatment, please don't hesitate to give us a call. We're open 24 hours a day, and our direct phone number is 1-833-272-7342. Once again, that phone number is 1-833-272-7342. I hope you all have a beautiful rest of your day. Much love and God bless. Peace.